left off last time. So we had about a third of last week's lesson that was looking at keeping baptism as you know, something that we has a meaning in our lives. And then um, we have one extra page of things there. I've been running around so much. I'm going to have to take off my coat or else I'm going to start perspiring all over the place. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's start with a short prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder of the importance of baptism this morning, that we got to see a little, little child baptized and brought into your kingdom. And may that also be meaningful to us as we reflect on the grace that you've given us in our own baptism. May it be part of our lives uh, regularly so that we always learn to thank you for the good we have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... We're on page three. Uh, uh, if you're using last week's, it's page three. If you're using what I gave you this week, it's on the about halfway down the first page. I just put that first part to remind us where we are. Uh, it's giving baptism its place in, um, in our daily lives. Deserve to pay careful attention. Part A last week that we talked about was in our personal life, and then part B was in our congregational life. And that's where we get to the second half of that page. So we have the two Bible passages just to remind you where we're at here because it's kind of in the middle of things. So it was, um, you know, Old Testament had all these rules and laws about how they had to do things. That's what God told them to do and expected them to do. And we have freedom to worship. God does want us to worship him, but the how we have quite a bit more freedom to do so. And so we look at those two Bible passages in Colossians and Hebrews. So Annie, if you'd please read the Colossians Bible passage. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. In a, another passage, it talks very much about the same thing. Um, Margaret, if you'd read Hebrews. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, <clears throat> not the realities themselves. Yeah, the law can't save us. It was helpful to point people to Jesus, but uh, not so much. And then, most of you were here, maybe half of you, a little more, last week when we looked at those baptismal fonts, some of them in different churches. Just um, Especially a couple of those from medieval churches in Europe, just outstanding these days, it would be you'd be talking more than, I mean, to build those would be more than to build this church, and that's just for their baptismal font. Um, think about that. What does that communicate? Well, hopefully, what we take away from it is they were understanding that baptism is really important, and so that they wanted that to be something that drew attention and reminded people. Of, of the importance of it in their own lives. And a reminder, though, but also that just a little bit of a reminder, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're baptized in a million dollar baptismal font or one that is much more um, modest or like, well, three of our four, I can watch all four of our children, uh, basically just a dishwashing basin filled with water, and that's where they were baptized. Um, it, it's equally valuable because the, the value is in what God does in baptism, not in all of these outward things. So then we come third last from the bottom, and that's where we start up this week. What rules does God give New Testament believers concerning the art, architecture, and symbolism in our worship facilities in our worship areas. We shouldn't judge them. Pardon? We shouldn't judge. Okay, don't judge. You mean don't judge? Go to a different church and say, oh, that's, they don't do what's right. Okay. <coughs> what, what kind of rules has God given us? And you can't think of any, and that's a good sign because he didn't really give us any. Uh, the early Christians, you know where the earliest Christians first worshipped? In the temple. The temple um, that was a replacement for Solomon's temple, or that was a replacement, yeah, it was Herod's, so-called Herod's temple, 
that replaced the Rubbabel's temple that replaced Solomon's temple, uh, but it was the temple of the Old Testament. They worshiped in the temple because that was God's house. They very much saw Jesus as just a fulfillment of the Old Testament. They didn't see like this is over there and this is here. Um, uh, God didn't say you have to have a church. So again, after the first couple of decades, and uh, people worship mostly in houses, usually houses of better off people because they had more room in them, not because uh, other people's average person's houses were wrong, but they were too, too low for them to worship in, but because they wanted to have room to worship. So there aren't these um, rules for it. Nonetheless, the next question, why do we pay careful attention to the art and architecture of our places of worship. And this is really what, why I want to, where I want to get. There are no rules, but why do we still pay a lot of attention to it? Awesome. Bob? So that it enhances and doesn't distract our worship. All right. How do you see that here? Well, I don't see anything as being distracted at all, but all the symbols and stuff are parts They're, they're there for a reason. Yeah. It's, it's not decoration. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everything is, is here for a reason. Um, and that's useful, very useful. And so we try to have the design church or worship areas that do that, that focus us on what God does. Uh, or what, yeah, on, really on our faith and what God has done for us. And so you see, this is one of those things can I say it's wrong to have a worship space that consists of a stage? No, but what is a stage not doing? Which, and, and, and I am being a little bit critical, I guess, of, and I'm trying not to be, trying to be critical without being judgmental. And there's, there's, a, there's a line to be drawn, and hopefully I'll observe that. But in modern uh, American Christianity, the normal for most people is a stage. You have somebody standing up there or sitting up there who's got maybe one of those in front of him, and maybe a chair he sometimes sits on, and he's sitting there. What doesn't happen? In this setup, it's guiding us toward what thing? What are, what are the important things? The altar, the cross. The altar, yeah. This is where Christ's body and blood is given to us. The cross, a lot of, a lot of churches don't have crosses anymore. Even. Um, and the way we have it set up, why don't I just stand there in the middle and preach? It's not me entertaining you on Sunday morning. We have a pulpit and a lectern to say, this is God, there's, there's somebody who has been called to preach God's word, but this is God's word, not his. There's a reason for that. Uh, likewise, one of the things I love here that we didn't have um, in, in Kentucky is a place to kneel when you receive the Lord's Supper. This isn't, this isn't just Friend, my buddy Jesus, that we're enjoying a meal together, this is Jesus giving me something very special. In, as my Lord and Savior, he is giving me his body and blood. So all of these things, uh, even the steps that get to be a problem for some people, uh, to go up to receive the communion is a reminder we are going up to receive something from God. All of these things are important, and each of them is meant to, to be there for a reason. And hopefully, we start to think about it, it does focus us, yeah, and, and of course the cross is the center. It focuses us to that cross. Not to say again that other ways are wrong, but then you'd be better be very sure when you use other forms of worship, you'd better be very sure you're keeping Christ as the absolute center of your worship. And don't let it become a, a worship, I know it's not a worship of the person, but it becomes a worship that revolves around the person. A lot of our 
especially our mega churches, are like that. I, I know they're not, they don't intend it to be a worship of the person, but it does end up revolving around that person. Yeah. If you look uh, back at not even that far, you see even the church itself is shaped as a cross. Uh, you have the, you know, the signs that were out or the and if you look at the church at the top, down outside, you see the cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, in some churches, there's wonderful stained glass windows to point out the crucifixion, the resurrection, and uh, the devil's servant to themselves. Mm -hmm. So there were a number, can be a number of things in art and architecture that are used to glorify God mm -hmm. and enhance or at least explain to the degree of the gospel. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things that are available. But like you said, there's a great danger of becoming an entertainer. You go to church to be an entertainer. And uh, that, that's the problem today, as I see it. Like you said, it's not true. And, and for, I mean, our seminary talks about that, warns against that as you're coming up through it, training to be a pastor. And that's a big complex issue because there's a lot of human psychology in that, in, in the individual who's been called to watch out for as well. Um, this comes to this point because we're really just focusing on the baptismal font is what we're doing. But I, th I just want to take a little bit of an aside to think about some of these other things around here that are meant to convey a message. Um, by the way, our font was made, I don't know if you know this, this was made by one of our members. Some of you know that. Um, I have a font. Okay. It was made by okay. uh, Joseph. Yeah, Mar Marcotti. Yeah, Marcotti. Yeah, Marcotti uh, built this. I, I don't know, sometime when um, when Pastor Instant was here, I'm not sure when it was. You must have had another one before yeah. that. But other stuff was done by, yeah. Okay, and some of the, okay, so again, it's not made by a furniture company, but by a member yeah. who designed, built it. Um, yeah. So in, in our, what are, it asks just quickly, what are some ways a church can use art, architecture, symbolism to help people pay careful attention to God's gift of baptism? What is the font? The font, okay, you could have a great big font to do that. But even this, I, I mean, I, I don't know. The church I grew up in, big, beautiful church, but unfortunately they had the font kind of shoved over in the corner of the church. And I'm <coughs> glad that when I came here, it was right here front and center. And that's, that's where a baptismal font, sh it should be prominent. It doesn't have to be one place or another, but it's great when it is prominent. Also, pointing out baptism's importance, like this morning, we have hymns, right, that are specifically baptism hymns. This, this hymn is about baptism. Um, art and ceremony, likewise, uh, we don't have much ceremony typically around our Lutheran baptisms, although we do have it's a, a special order of service. Like this morning, you didn't go to page 154, you went to page 151. So we have a special part, a special order of service to be followed when we have baptism. It's saying this is important enough to do something different in our worship. Um, it's not just like an announcement at the end of church. Okay, we'll go to the, uh, and I guess I'm different pages than you probably have, or I guess some of us have different pages. Uh, let's say together the following stands up. Here stands the font before our eyes, telling how God did receive us. The altar recalls Christ's sacrifice and what the sacrament gives us. Here is the, the scriptures that proclaim Christ yesterday, today the same, and evermore our Redeemer. And it's in the very nicely sums up the three main pieces of quote unquote furniture that we have in front of church. You have the font, you have the altar, and you have, well, we have a lectern and a, and a pulpit, but you have the places that the word is read from. So that's uh, traditionally how the church is arranged. The fourth part of baptism, which is from Luther's small catechism says, baptism means 
that the old, and, and oh, just by the way, we just read this this morning in the order of baptism. It was part of the service. Baptism means that the old Adam in us should be drowned by daily contrition and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Uh, just for a review, what is contrition? If we're supposed to have daily contrition and repentance, what does contrition mean? I like what they did in the hymnal. They didn't, we didn't use that word this morning. They said daily sorrow and repentance because re contrition is that realization that what I have done is as, as a sin. What I have done is offensive to God. So it's not just, yeah, I did something wrong. It's not admitting. Sometimes you hear people give those sorts of apologies, right? Yeah, uh, well, I shouldn't have, but, um, but it actually involves also the realization, admitting that that was wrong uh, on my part. And then repentance. Repentance is... The realization, okay, asking for forgiveness. It's not just like we can talk, and, and sometimes it's pointed out, Judas, in a sense, felt contrition. He had betrayed Jesus, and he knew it, right? But he didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't look for forgiveness. Uh, so it's the other thing. So the realization has to go together with uh, seeking, God's, or seeking God's forgiveness. And then when we get forgiveness, and repentance really can includes two things, looking for God's forgiveness, trusting in God's forgiveness in Christ, and a desire to do what? Yeah, right. As Jesus said in John 8 to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. So it includes that too, a desire to live the new life. Uh, last two Bible passages, Matthew. Kyle, if you'd please read that one. Jesus said to his disciples, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. And then also to John, which again is very much a, a parallel passage. Jesus first sent his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So how does God help a contrite and repentant sinner find relief? To his forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. And, and what did Jesus, who, who is the one who gets to talk about that? Jesus gives this to his disciples, right? And his church. And that can come at many different levels. So... Um, we can look at when, whenever somebody confesses, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, we can say, you're forgiven. We don't, I mean, and sometimes I do this too, is just say, okay, I understand. But what I really need to say is, I'm forgiven. Or, and I shouldn't say, oh, well, do better next time. I should say, you're forgiven. That's the thing that releases you from that sense of guilt. Uh, Trying better next time, and then, oops, I didn't quite do it. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't release us from that guilt. So the, we have a privilege, as Christ gave to his church, to tell people you are forgiven in Christ. And each time it is a sense, it, it says it is a return to baptism. I'll discuss three ways, uh, just briefly here. My wife took my phone, so I don't, I, I can't keep track of time today. Uh, so, discuss these three ways that God invites each of us to relive our baptism. Confession and absolution before God. When does that happen? Communion. That's a time individually. I, I, I hope each and every person is going through that as you receive communion, realizing this is for the forgiveness of my sin. And? Daily. Da okay, daily prayer to God. Where we can daily, um, even something so simple as a really 
and I don't know if we always realize it, uh, Jesus, Savior, wash away all that has been wrong today. Maybe you were taught that as a child. Why is that such an important prayer for a child to know? That's confession and forgiveness. Did you realize that? Uh, that's a really good prayer because what it's doing is confessing sin and being forgiven for sin. Jesus, Savior, wash away all that has. It's kind of just flipping it around. You're talking about forgiveness first, but you get what I'm saying there. So you're even, even in something like that, especially that particular prayer, is a really good one to teach little kids because already there you're starting to do what we need to be daily doing, um, find, uh, confessing and receiving forgiveness from God. Confession and absolution, the, the last two I can kind of put together before a fellow Christian or before your pastor, doesn't happen often, but once in a while it does. Somebody is just so sometimes overwrought, sometimes fed up with, sometimes distressed over sin, and they need to just get it off their chest, so to speak. And that sometimes happens. And that's a privilege for a pastor uh, to be able to assure somebody in those times of their forgiveness. And I would encourage people, if you're at that time where coming weekly to hear forgiveness pronounced or through the Lord's Supper or daily through your prayers, if it's just, if it's just not giving you peace of conscience, um, do take that time to talk to a Christian or your pastor about sin and hear God's good news. So as a closing prayer, we can say this. Well, it's not our closing prayer because we're going to keep going. Let's say this stanza together. Grant then, O God, your will be done, that when the church bells are ringing, many in saving faith may come where Christ his message is bringing. I know my own, my own know me. You, not the world, my face shall see. My peace I leave with you all. Okay, um, had one guy who at, at, uh, would always say that at the end of every service, he would, instead of saying, um, good morning, pastor, whatever, he'd always say, peace be with you. Um, that was always, the first few times it, it strikes you, and then, then you go through this time where it's like, oh, yeah, that's what he always says, and then after a few more months, it's like, that's, that's great. I mean, we just have this way of always... You know, the, the routine we sometimes put off to the side, but then uh, later it's like, that really is great that to hear that peace of God is ours. Uh, the other thing I wanted to look at, because I knew we would have some extra time that just the end of that lesson would, um, wouldn't cover our time. I wanted to look at two current events. Uh, they're kind of off topic, but they're worth just mentioning about. And... The first one was, what's a funeral about? Just to give a little bit of background on this. This is an article, and I'm not going to talk about the issue that the article was about. Uh, what it was, was about a week ago, there was a Catholic church in New York. They were kind of duped into holding a funeral for an atheist transgender woman. And it was just, it was appalling. I didn't watch it, but from what I've heard, it was just absolutely... And, but the Catholic Church, it sounds like, was basically duped into giving that. Um, and it was, anyway, so, and afterwards the Archbishop actually uh, declared that they should have a uh, ceremony of, what is it? Uh, well, I can't remember what it's called officially, but essentially a ceremony of cleansing for the church. To feel, they felt like the church had been desecrated by the people that were there. And I think rightly so, they weren't being judgmental. Uh, it was people who were there to mock Christianity. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. What I want to talk about is the first paragraph of the article because it made me think, okay, uh, for humanists, the purpose of a funeral is to memorialize life. For Catholics, the point is to pray for the deceased soul and at the subsequent reception to rem reminisce. And then just added, for some transgender activists, the point is apparently to create a political spectacle. Uh, 
So what is the point? So yeah, you have people who use a funeral as an opportunity to make, to talk, to make a political point. You have others who say, well, I just want a, you know, a celebration of life and, and that's all. It's just gonna be a celebration of life. That's a humanist or the Catholic that says, uh, the point is to pray for the deceased's soul. What is the Lutheran purpose for a funeral? I think it's good that we think about that. What is the Lutheran purpose for a funeral? And, and there's there's a ch- there's an opportunity to share the gospel. Definitely, there are people who don't show up for a worship service ever will have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Another, what, what do we want to convey to the people most affected? It's the comfort of eternal life. This person was brought to know their Lord and Savior in this life, and now we know that they have eternal life in heaven. We want that comfort. I would put that as the primary purpose, <laughs> is the comfort of eternal life given to the survivors. Now, there are secondary purposes. I look at it also as an opportunity to share the gospel with people who won't always hear it. Um, and anything else? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Getting to what Jane had said, Christ is to be the center of this. Um, sometimes you're going to have people who come to a, a Lutheran funeral and they're going to feel kind of dissatisfied. You were supposed to say more good things about this person. Um, you were supposed to uh, have some good laughs about there, and we we don't discount uh, that, but that's not part of the service, right? Um, one time I made the mistake of because I thought, I, yeah, I, I thought the person had some different. I thought they were more <laughs> spiritually oriented in what they wanted to say, and they weren't. The only time is the first and last and only time I will ever let anybody say anything in a church at a funeral other than myself. Um, it's important that all that other stuff, say it after church, say it at the reception, at the graves, maybe at the graveside, um, but the service is about Christ, what Christ has done for that person, that's primary. And then we can also say, thank you, Lord, for this person and the thing they, they've done. We can say that uh, in, in a measured way, just like Hebrews 11, that's that book that says, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses did this, by faith, um, it goes through all these people in the Old Testament. It's not wrong to say, to give thanks to God for what people have been and done, but that's not to be the focus. So um, we do have a little different perspective on, on what a funeral is than many people. Just realize that, and it's good for us to remember that when we have, uh, for, for those times when we do have one. I don't know if anyone, I know Pastor had made a comment. I don't know if anyone else wants to make a comment on that particular one. Okay. When Pastor Ann said, he said he was in his glory because he had all these people that don't come to church and he felt he could really reach out yep. to them. Right. So, you know. It is. And keeping Christ, Christ. Christ. Yep. And it is. It's an awesome opportunity for outreach. Um, or, or to at least let the gospel be heard. Uh, the other thing, I don't know, what time is it just now? 10.50. 10 to, okay, so we have 10 minutes. That's what I was kind of about hoping for. Well, seven minutes. Oh, seven? Yeah. Seven minutes, okay. Yeah, if we go seven to 10. Um, this last week, there was another thing that 
probably that many people, I've heard people talking about too, is that Alabama ruling against an IVF clinic. Uh, just the first thing I want to say is the material facts of this, because I have not seen the facts of this case. I've heard lots of people go off on rants or on praise, but I've heard almost nothing about the facts of the case. So just here, the material facts of the case are this. The three couples who brought the Alabama case concerning an in vitro fertilization clinic are not, as anyone casually following the news or hearing a President Biden statement might think, they were not pro-life activists hostile to IVF. They wanted to have children via IVF. But a patient wandered into the facility where the clinic meets, where the clinic stored embryos and dropped several of them. The parents sued the clinic for negligence under the state's wrongful death statute. The state Supreme Court ruled that the embryos fell within that statute. So that's the fact of the case, which, as I've said, I have heard no place else other than this one place that I happen to see. It. So the state is... The judges were basically asked, so what happened here? Is this just an issue of somebody broke something and it's property that got broken? Or is this life that got broken? Which is, of course, a critical issue. I mean, you say it with your kids, right? I mean, it's like, uh, if, if, if you know, uh, if somebody wants to take the car, you let them have the car. It's just, it's just stuff. You save your life. And that's kind of the difference here is, is this just stuff, property, or is this a human life? And um, the court ruled that this is human life under that statute. Now, this is, um, I looked online for the Wells Christian Life Resources. Uh, this is their comment on it. I would just, of course emphasize, while it is online, this is a sort of comment that is written in in a short period of time. So it, it's, it's a, a short term, it isn't like an official statement. I, I would hesitate to go that far. But this is, I think, where Christian Life Resources would stand on this. So uh, we'll read this through, this one thing, um, paragraph by paragraph. And Norman, if I could have you uh, start with the first paragraph, and we'll have comment afterwards. I'll open that to other people. What continues? Thank you. 
I, I bring this up and I just want to be clear. This is not a political point. This is a moral point. This is what does God have to say about this, these practices. So we're not really debating the, the court ruling. That's not really the point. But what he mentions here in the Christian Life Resources is he says that this is basically saying what we believe about human life. So I, I don't know if anybody has any comment that they would like to make on this or question that they would have about this. What, one of the things with IVF is that, um, you know, on, on the one hand, what you hear is the positive side is that people who are not able to have children have children, which is good and each of those children we'd call a blessing. But on the other hand, we know that at least, even with, as far as it's progressed, at least 80% of attempted pregnancies for IVF do not, uh, do not happen. Uh, or there's a, either they don't take or there's a miscarriage. Plus, in each of those, usually they take a multi, they take multiple, sometimes depending, many, um, embryos to try and implant them. So what you have is this, uh, and even if several do, oftentimes they will remove several of those um, pregnancies. So like you have, there was a few years ago, a lady who had, was it eight children? Because of IVF. A lot of times people will say, no, you get rid of all of them, but one or two. And so you're killing actually several um, in, in one time. So. Here it's pointing, the article I think uses this uh, court ruling to bring up a reminder, you know, IVF should not be done. It's the thing, I mean, we understand people's sorrow and, uh, but, and what they would like to have, but on the other hand, the fact that it leads to the death of so many other children, we cannot, it cannot be, there can be no excuses for it. Um, so. It helps to clarify and to talk about some things we don't always think of when these items come up. Okay, well, um, we at that time, we're at the end of our time here. Uh, hopefully that uh, helps to talk about some current issues and always willing to, if you think of something over the next week you'd like to say about those, uh, please do. Next week we can talk about it as well. So let's close with a short prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in baptism uh, you make us yours. We thank you that we, we got to see that this morning. Help us to always have pe be people who revere life and most of all who desire that life results in a time of grace that people will come to know their Savior, Jesus Christ. Make us willing to speak about that to others. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.